Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. Remember, in these videos, I take about eight used firearms that have come into the store and give you guys about a two to four minute review of each to give you guys an idea of some different stuff out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is strictly to be entertaining and educational. I am not making this video to sell anything to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. Anyway, guys, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, this video is brought to you by our new website, webuyguns.com. If you are considering selling a firearm or firearms collection, please log on to our website and create an account. From there, you can submit your firearms for an offer request. We will provide you with an offer within about 24 hours. With those offers, you do get a printable offer certificate, which you can take with you around to your local gun stores to try and get yourself a better deal on your firearm. If you're unable to secure yourself a better deal, go ahead and sell it to us. We do provide you with a shipping label. Also, we do pay you with either a check or ACH direct deposit to make the process as easy and seamless for you as possible. Remember, please go check us out at webuyguns.com. Come. Getting into this video, you guys remember the format. We start with most common and move through least common as the video progresses. Starting us off in our first spot, this is a pretty cool little pistol. This is a Beretta Model 70S. Now this one comes to us from a viewer in Wisconsin, so thank you so much for sending that one along to us. The story with this pistol would actually begin back in World War II when we had the Italian Beretta Model 1934 and 1935. Now those are really small pistols like this that were actually standard issued by the Ital Italian military. Uh, 1934, 1935, respectively a 380 and a 32 ACP. Uh, the 34 was a 380, the 35 was a 32, if I don't have that backwards. Um, they were known for being very reliable, very ergonomic, uh, very functional pistols, but of course they were very small as a standard issue military sidearm. Now in the 1950s, uh, between, you know, post-World War II, Italy would go to the model of 1951, which by a lot of people's accounts would be sort of the first variation of the, the sort of the first step or first iteration of the Italian M9 that we know of, the 92FS that we know of today, which was a steel frame single stack pistol. I actually have one, I'll grab it for you. All right, here's a 1951 model, 1951, and I actually did a dedicated video on this a couple years ago. But Italy would go to this in the 1950s, and this would be their first real full-size service pistol since the World War I era Galicenti or Galesi. I always forget how to pronounce that. One of the iconic things about it was this crossbar safety. It is a single action only, so when you're on safe, you could reach up here and pop it off safe with this crossbar safety. You didn't have to actuate a lever safety, which would have been found up here in the midsection of the frame on the earlier 1934 and 1935 Beretta. So this was a big design improvement. They did keep the heel magazine release, which is a uh, very European, actually, I'm sorry, it's not heel magazine. It is at the base of the, uh, of the grip, indicative of a heel release where you do have your offhand come to actuate that so that you can actually grip the magazine and discard it with your hand, keeping it from dropping on the ground and losing it, things like that of that nature. But kind of that philosophy of magazine uh, releases was popular in Europe at the time and still is today in a lot of cases. Um, now, through the 1950s, both the Italian mainly police forces as well as Beretta wanted to come out with a offering on their line that would harken back sort of to the small concealed carry compact variations that were popular with the 1934 and 1935. So in about 1958, they would come out with this design, and it would have been known to many people as the Puma, but it was the model of 1970. Now, the original model 1970 would be offered in 32 ACP, uh, as well as 380, which is this is what this is chambered in, and 22 long rifle. Now, shortly after, they would come out with an S model, and S, the S model was really mainly an export model. So the original 70, model 1970, looked very much like this in form, but like this in function. So it did have a crossbar safety just like you have here, and also had that base magazine release that we see on the 1951. The S retained this variation as well, and the S was also offered in the three calibers. Now the S, instead of going to that crossbar safety, used a thumb style safety right here on the side so you could actuate it with one hand. So this was definitely a design improvement going from, again, the earlier flip style safety here, which required your off hand to come up here and manipulate, going over to something that you can use with your dominant shooting hand. 
uh, all in one place. And this sort of concept with uh, safeties is popular today. Okay, so a very, very interesting pistols. These would stay in production until about the 1980s. Uh, and they would mainly see Italian uh, police use as well as uh, Israeli police use as well. So this one here is a 380. Really, really cool pistol. Um, pricing on these on the market, you're anywhere from about four to six hundred dollars, depending on condition and what it comes with. Uh, something like this, this is an excellent condition, would probably be in about the five range, five to six hundred dollars. So just really, really cool, really, really cool pistols. Very ergonomic. Um, just a nice overall releases here. Nice overall design and concept. So anyway, there it is, the Beretta Model 70. Uh, this one particularly, the 70S. Okay, up next is a very, very popular rifle. And this one comes to us from a viewer in Pennsylvania. So thank, thank you so much for sending this one along to us. This is an Arsenal SLR 107R 7.62x39 stamped receiver variant of the famed Arsenal AK pattern rifles. Now the history with this would actually begin in the late 1800s with the forming of the original Arsenal factory in Bulgaria, which was actually the very first state-owned uh, arsenal to exist in the country. Now it would go through a series of changes and redevelopments over the years through the 30s and 40s and 50s. It would make things like uh, finely produced uh, machine parts and then artillery uh and armor uh components and parts and then through about the cold war the 1960s and 70s they would get into the development of the ak pattern of rifle now the arsenal also commonly referred to as the circle 10 that was typically the arsenal markings you would find on their products if you have the bulgarian contract makarovs you'd find the circle 10 markings on those as well you might have some ak magazines with the circle 10 markings uh same company the the arsenal ad factory from bulgaria now, in 1999, Arsenal Inc., which is not the same company, was founded in Las Vegas. They would actually be somewhat of a sister company to Arsenal AD in Bulgaria and would be more of a United States domestic import of the product. So it would be set up with training, infrastructure, tooling on the, on the product. They would be shipped into the United States. There, Arsenal Inc. would do the uh, 922R compliance uh, type stuff, putting on U.S. made stocks. Uh, trigger components. Uh, recently, I think in about 2020, they went to the newer uh, Arsenal Inc. trigger uh, uh, group and there's just a nicer trigger uh, to meet with the 922R compliance, which is six US made parts on an AK pattern of rifle. Um, this also has the circle 10 markings here on the trunnion. Um, they have been very, very popular rifles and are some of the last foreign import rifles to come into the country. The other popular ones being the Wassers from Romania. Um, really, really known for their quality, also really known for their price tags. So the stamped receiver variants, the SLR series, typically start in about the $1,200 and go up from there. Uh, they did have the 545 by 39 variants, but unfortunately they've discontinued those. They did just come out with the 556 variant. And of course, the very, very popular SAM series, the SAM 7, uh, uh, those are the milled receiver variants. They have the uh, side folders, the fixed stocks, and the under folders as well. And those typically right now are selling about $1,600 to $1,700. So these are a little bit less expensive. They did have a run of them come into the country last year in 2020. As far as I know, there's still some that they're trying to move. Um, uh, Fine Group is one of the biggest movers of the uh, of the Arsenal products, so uh, you could usually log into their website and order them. But you know they are still few and far between today. And again, on the used market, these the SLR series are going 1,200 and up, so it's pretty pretty standard. But they are very very well made, uh, very very finely produced AKs that have been made or that are manufactured from a plant that has made them since the Cold War. So I always personally like to stick to foreign made AKs. So Currently on the market, you know, since the Stava has moved here, uh, Kalashnikov, con Kalashnikov concern, uh, I really personally like to stick with the Bulgarian or the Romanian manufactured AKs or the Chinese ones when you can find them, <laughs> you know, if the pricing permits. But anyway, really, really cool rifle. I was really happy to get this one in. If you ever get a chance to look at an arsenal, I definitely really like them. I've owned several myself. Uh, so yeah, definitely worth taking a look at if you're looking to get that one AK, be one and done. A really nice quality piece. Definitely don't overlook the Arsenal SLR or CM series of rifles. All right, up next is a really cool, really classic revolver that actually comes to us from a local customer here. This is a Magnum Research BFR. And BFR stands for Big Frame Revolver. A lot of people like to say it stands for Big Effing Revolver, <laughs> which would not be a misnomer for it. 
Uh, but it is a very, very large, very heavy revolver, of course, coming from Magnum Research, the same ones who bring about the uh, Desert Eagle. Another very large caliber, very large weighted, uh, mainly fire, uh, handguns, pistols, revolvers, that sort of thing. This is on a single action design. Um, rotates the cylinder freely, so you have your cylinder actuated by the loading gate itself, not dissimilar to a modern uh, Ruger product like a Ruger Wrangler or something along those lines. Single action, as the name would suggest. A very nice trigger, adjustable sights with a high vis fiber optic front. Now, they make these in two cylinder types a long cylinder and a short cylinder. And they come, they make these in somewhere between about 10 to 15 different calibers. Uh, on the long cylinder, you're going to get things like the 3030, the 375, uh, 45 Colt, 410, 4570, which is what this is, the 460, the 500, the 50 Beowulf. On the uh, the short cylinder, you're going to get things like the 22 Hornet, uh, 454 Casul, the 480 Ruger, the 50 Action Express, so on and so forth. And in the um, the short cylinder, they do offer it, I believe, in a five inch, uh, seven and a half, and I think the 10. I do know in the long cylinder, they offer it in the seven and a half and a 10, and this is the seven and a half uh, configuration. Now, this was designed in 1999 by a gentleman of the name of John, uh, I'm sorry, Jim uh, Territon in, um, in about 2005, the rights to this firearm were actually purchased by Magnum Research, and then uh, Mr. Tareton himself was brought on board by Magnum Research as their uh, director of R&D and development, or, or research and development, obviously, um, and product design. So he's actually been on board with them. I don't know if he's still there, uh, but I do know that as a result of the adaptation of this uh, revolver, he was brought on board with them. They are really, really nice revolvers. Um, really because of the caliber offerings, you can do a whole lot of different things with them. Anything from plinking to uh, hunting to even uh, large game hunting, you know, being in something like this in a 4570, or just like what anybody else would want a large caliber revolver for, you know, just to impress their friends and family at the range and that sort of thing. Um, this does compete well in the class of things like the 500 Magnum from Smith & Wesson, and it is priced at about the same. Uh, to get one of these uh, new or used, you're going to be in about $1,000 to $1,200 plus range, depending on what it has. Uh, but they are definitely really cool and a really simple design. I've actually shot one of these in 4570, specifically this exact uh, model with the 7.5 inch barrel, not this exact uh, pistol that you see in front of you, but the same model. Um, and it wasn't that difficult to handle. Uh, we were shooting uh, Hornady uh, lever revolution rounds, but you, know, you get both hands on it. Definitely do does well because it is a very weighty pistol. Um, have uh, drilled and tapped up here at the top if you want to put an optic or anything else like that, but not much else really to say about it. Really, really cool firearm. I have had, let's see, Nothing else in there. I have had only one of these ever in my store that was new. I've never had a used one, so I do not see them too commonly, but they have been on the market for, you know, a few years. But uh, anyway, really, really cool product. Really happy to get that in and share it with you guys. So if you're looking to uh, fill that large caliber revolver need out on the range or out uh, hunting, this is definitely one you should consider. Uh, the Magnum Research BFR. Okay, up next is a really, really cool firearm. This is a Desert Eagle. Uh, Magnum Research Desert Eagle and the Gold Tiger Stripe Edition. Now this one comes to us from a viewer in Illinois. I did have a Desert Eagle on one of the videos maybe a month or two ago, so I'll briefly go over the history real quick with you guys. Um, this would really start, uh, a lot of people look at the Magnum Research Desert Eagle and think 50 Action Express. Now the 50 was designed by Evan Wilden of Action Arms in about 1988 and in fact the magnum research the desert eagle was not the very first to be chambered in the 5080 that would be the auto mag 5 which i've also had one of those in a more recent video maybe a couple weeks ago but soon would follow that the desert eagle would be chambered in that round and that is what most people usually purchase these in they also make them in 44 magnum and 357 which is what this one is a 357. now uh, if we go to about the late 1980s, Magnum Research is starting design concepts on this large frame semi-automatic pistol on a large caliber. Really, where they really start with the design patents is on the tri-rotating locking lug system. If you look at it, it is not dissimilar to that you would find on an AR-15. And it does operate on a gas system, not a gas blowback system but a gas operating system that's more indicative of a rifle more than it is a handgun, again, to help it cycle those larger calibers under those hotter pressures. 
Now, they would co-op the final design details of this with IMI, that's Israeli Military Industries in Israel, who would actually begin the main manufacturing of this product until about 1995 when Magnum Research would move it back to the United States in Maine with a company called Seiko. Seiko would continue production of these firearms until about 1998 when Magnum Research would move it back to Israel. Now, IMI had changed its name to IWI by this time, known as Israeli uh, Weapons Industries, excuse me, and they would continue production on this until Magnum Research would actually bring it back home and produce it locally in Pillager, Minnesota, until the company was purchased by Car Arms in about 2010, who now owns the rights to the brand and the firearm itself, and they are still in production today. Now, they do make these in a multitude of different varieties with the different rails, the different uh, finish types, the stainless, the gold, the gold tiger stripe. This is kind of the, the most premium version that they offer. I don't even know if you can really find these anymore uh, because they tend to be pretty hard to find on the market. Now, new, they would retail at an MSRP of about $2,300 but these have actually exceeded that used uh, both in 357, 44, and 50 AE. 50 being the most desirable, of course, 357. I guess there's some people who want them, but when you're talking about a firearm with this size, um, typically it's the 50 or the 44 that most people gravitate towards. There's really not a whole lot of practical use for something like this beyond fun at the range, especially when you're talking a very bright and shiny gold-plated or bright stainless or chromed uh, variation. Uh, fun at the range really is the main uh, reason people have these. Also for collecting purposes. A lot of people who are video game and movie uh, enthusiasts definitely typically like to follow the markets on the on the uh, Desert Eagle, the, the Magnum Research Desert Eagles, as they have been featured ad nauseum on the silver screen and in video games. So really, really cool firearm with a very lengthy lineage and history of being around for about 40 plus years. Um, and you know, the design constantly being revamped and changed and modernized. So really, really cool firearm, uh, especially really cool to get one in the gold tiger stripe edition. Uh, again, these and the Tiger Stripe, you're probably going to see them around 2500 up in any of the calibers right now. So this one's in excellent condition. I'm not even sure. It looks like maybe it's been fired, but typically when you find these, these have had very few rounds through them, uh, mainly just because, you know, people buy them just to have them, not to shoot them. Uh, especially if you're looking 50 Action Express, that stuff can go about, you know, three bucks around right now, maybe more, three to five dollars around. So. Uh, I guess one advantage in the 357 is the less expensive ammo. Uh, you can also buy the barrels on the more modern uh, Desert Eagles and swap them out. So change your calibers around and stuff like that. So really, really cool. Happy to have that in. Thanks to our viewer for sending this one along to us. Okay, up next is a really popular rifle and actually one that's pretty difficult to find. This is a Marlin Model 1895 SBL, chambered in 4570, and these were only chambered in 4570. These are really a design adaptation off of the popular Marlin 336, which itself was developed in the 1940s as sort of a final design culmination from the original patents by uh, Mr. Hepburn of Marlin, who had famed the Marlin action and design throughout the late 1890s, going from first a top eject like was popular in the 1800s to the fixed top or the, the closed top receiver section that ejects out the side, which the 336, or really the 36 and then the 336, as kind of uh, capitalized on as becoming one of the most popular lever action rifles in the United States, second only to probably the Winchester Model 19, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 1894 as in terms of you know the most popularly used lever action hunting rifle in 3030 which is mostly what you would find the 336 in now in the 1970s they would release the model 1895 it was really the new model 1895 which was to be a nod to the original model of 1895 which was discontinued in about 1914. Uh, coming out as sort of the big bore, big caliber 4570 lever action rifle, it has been met with a lot of success and is probably one of the most coveted and sought after Marlin lever action rifles out on the market. So really, really cool firearm. They also have the model 1895 government, uh, the standard model, which I actually have a version of. I'll show you real quick. And that is this one right here. So you see a nice sort of side by side. I should have really started off with both of them. Let's see here. Kind of put those there side by side and really nice classic Marlin 4570 rifles. Um, really, really cool. Now, the SBL in general, again, is one of the most interesting variations. It's got the stainless finish with a laminated wood stock and this sort of grayish, bluish configuration. Now, this particular one was actually upgraded by a company called WWG called Wild West Guns. 
Uh, you actually send them the firearm and they do a complete overhaul on the firearm, including a full new lever by WWG with the large loop. They added this lever screw, which is actually a thumb tightened screw, so you can take it apart in the field, uh, field strip it without having to bring any tools along with you or anything like that. And they replace the ejector, the trigger, uh, the follower plug, um, and the hammer spur, also marked WWG. So really nice, overvamped, uh, revamped uh, Midwest uh, Industries, uh, sort of a free-floated, if you will, uh, M-Lock handguard on here, little vertical grips. This is really bringing the concept of the lever gun into the modern era. So really, really cool. The 1895s currently on the market are bringing quite a bit of money. If we're talking about the standard government model, they're probably around $1,000 mark, uh, give or take, uh, given on its condition right now. Um, the SPLs are actually climbing up there, uh, starting at a thousand and going way up from there. So if you look on gun broker and places like that, these have definitely gone uh, pretty high. Typical MSRP on something like this though is typically brand new, about $1,200 when you can find one. So really, really cool products nonetheless. Uh, just model 1895, uh, government and the SPL. Up next is a really cool classic revolver from Smith & Wesson. This is a Model 65-2, and it comes to us from a viewer in Arizona. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. The Model 65 was really the stainless steel version of the Model 13. Now, the 65 would be produced from 1972 to 2004, and the Model 13 from 1974 to 1998. Now, when it comes to model designations, Smith & Wesson will change up model names based on seemingly arbitrary features like finish, barrel length, caliber, as seen on their revolvers and their third-generation steel frame uh, semi-autos as well. Now, both this and the Model 13 were a 357 configuration with a five-round, uh, yep, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, six-round cylinder offered in either the round or the square butt on the K-frame. Now, if we look at one with a little bit more features, something like adjustable rear sights and an under lug, then you would be looking at the Model 19. So uh, basically it's essentially the same firearm other than those features. Now this was an economized variation in their uh, revolver lineup on the K-frame model meant for really military and police or M&P uh, practicality, mainly police. Now these would have been used by Oklahoma Highway Patrol as well as the NYPD. Uh, really at a good aggressive price point is what would be found from other offerings throughout the 70s and 80s. Now, of course, as we get through the 90s, some automatics would become king, and which is probably why we saw these fall off in the late 90s to early 2000s. Now, if we look at the price point on these, uh, they do tend to be going up in really, really good condition like this without their box. You might be in about the five to $600 range. With their box in better condition, uh, you might be closer to 800 to 1,000, you know, depending on your buyer. So since they are not manufactured anymore, they do have that sort of police issue uh, mystique about them. Really nice functional, nice weighted, heavy, really well balanced revolver either the 13 or the 65, whether you like blue or stainless, really, really cool uh, firearms. And there's definitely buyers and collectors out there for them. So really happy to get this one in. Uh, this is a Model 65-2 357 double single action revolver. Okay, up next is a really, really cool popular rifle that a lot of you guys I'm sure have seen before. This is a Martini Henry. This one comes to us from a viewer in Oklahoma. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. The Mar uh, Martini Tannery would actually be pretty popular around the time of British colonialism in the late 1800s. Really would come on, on board in about the early 1870s and would actually stay in service in the British military through about the end of World War I, although it would be uh, discontinued from production in the early 1890s, around 1891-1892 or so. This was chambered in the 577 450 cartridge. It did feature a falling block action, which was actually a design iteration off of the Peabody rifle, which was designed by Henry Peabody. The adaptation was done by a gentleman of the name of uh, Frederick Martini. That combined with the polygonal rifling design concept from Alexander Henry, came up with the, uh, the term the Martini Henry rifle. Now, in British service, um, uh, cal or, I'm sorry, design change iterations, they are known as having a mark designation. In the United States armaments, we typically have an A designation. So like M1A1 is M1 submachine gun alteration one. Um, 1911A1 is 1911 pistol alteration one. Uh, in British service, as they made design changes, they would go with the Mark series. The Martina Henry was mainly known as being Mark one through four. This is a Mark two. The Mark II is really mainly known for being used in the Zulu Wars. Uh, again, uh, just ideal and not really ideal, but very iconic for, uh, for British imperialism. One of the things that was, I know, 
uh, marked out to 1,800 yards. As the mark changes happened on the Martini Henry, I'm not too sure what the exact designation will changes were, or what they changed. Um, but I do know that, uh, obviously, that this is a Mark II. Now, this one is actually a Nepalese contract made in Nepal and was probably done so after about 1895. Now, at that time, uh, Britain was looking at transitioning into the bolt-action magazine-fed rifles, the SMLE series, the number one series of rifles, which they would move into prior to World War I. Uh, so at about that time, uh, manufacturing and contracting would go out to places like Nepal. It's probably about when this was manufactured. Now you do have the Nepalese markings here on the buttstock, here on the bottom of uh, the trigger guard as well. So pretty interesting uh, firearm. These are pretty well coveted by collectors because they are really re uh, readily regarded as some of the best single shot uh, rifles of the time. Now they did rival the 1873 Springfield Trap Door, but a lot of people would say that this was, you know, really one of the best and mo most robust design concepts. Uh, it did replace the uh, Snyder Enfield, which was an adaptation from a muzzle loader to a cartridge-fed rifle. Uh, just like the 1873 first had the, you know, the uh, Allen conversions. Uh, so too did these from you kind of have a step gap between self-contained uh, cartridge and muzzle loader from the muzzle loader to the infield, just like the 1873 was from the muzzle loader to the 1903 Springfield, so, or the 1917 Eddie Stone, or, or what of that nature. But uh, really, really cool rifles. If we look at pricing, pricing is all over the board to, uh, based on condition. A Nepalese contract just like this, uh, and this is really in beautiful condition for its age. Uh, these are probably going around $1,000 plus. So just a really, really cool, iconic piece of British military history. British colonialism, uh, imperialism, um, military history in general. So just really, really cool. The Martini Henry, you just do not see these on the market too much anymore. So I'm really happy to get this one in. Okay, last but not least is a really cool classic revolver that comes to us from a viewer in Illinois. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. This is the Colt King Cobra. It is a 357 Magnum revolver with a six round capacity. Colt manufactured these both in stainless and blued. And you could get them in a two and a half, a two, a four, a six, or an eight inch barrel. This one here is the four inch, which is probably the most commonly found. Now, Colt would introduce this in 1986 and produce it until 1992 when it would be discontinued. Then in 1994, they would re-up production until about 1998 when it would be discontinued again. And then a lot of you guys probably remember just a couple years ago in 2019, they reintroduced the revolver again and it's still being manufactured today. A lot of people have debate or arguments over what is better built, the new one that just came out or the original ones like this. Based on looking at it and based on the fact that it is part of the snake gun family, you would probably assume that it is meant to be a design iteration off of the Colt Python. It is actually not. It really has a lot more in common with the Trooper series. Uh, you guys actually saw the lawman that I did, I believe it was last week, which is uh, a more economized version of the Trooper. The Trooper and the lawman were meant to be economy firearms introduced for the police market. Keep in mind things like the Python that first came out in the 1950s uh, definitely took a lot of very skilled labor to manufacture. There was a lot of hand fitting and polishing and it took a very specialized people, uh, you know, masters of their trade to, put them, to uh, put them together and that was not cheap. As labor became more expensive through the 70s and then through the 80s, uh, manufacturers like Colt would have to come up with ways to economize their firearms if they're going to market them and sell them in higher volumes to the commercial market for one, but more importantly, the bigger markets like police and military who are not going to be interested in paying top dollar for premium hand fit firearms. So you had a departure off of that concept into the trooper. And then the idea on the King Cobra was to make the Trooper or more robust and defined firearm, uh, still keeping up with the modern production, uh, you know, necessities of keeping things more economized, but beefing up the design and making it a little bit more appealing to both law enforcement and the commercial market. They did things like add this uh, rib up here to the top of the barrel. They thickened and, and strengthened the profile of the barrel as well. They added a full length under lug uh, here to the barrel. So a lot of attention was paid to the front end. Uh, you could get this in either the combat grips, which is what this is, a hard rubber, or the wood grips. And then in 1998 alone, they introduced it with a the top strap being drilled and tapped for scope rings. This was only offered in 1998, which is the quickest way you can tell that this one was made in 1998, short of also looking at the serial number. The action is still very, very, very smooth, very refined on the medium frame Colt frame. 
uh, it's still just a really, really nice, well-made, very classic, good-feeling firearm. On the market today, the original uh, Colt King Cobras, not so much the uh, the modern production ones, are definitely climbing up there in value, and you typically find them, depending on condition, depending if they come with the original box or not, uh, upwards of about the $1,400, $1,500 plus range. So uh, definitely steadily climbing. A lot of collectors out there for the original uh, Colt Snake Gun, so still really, really cool. Uh, if you ever get the chance to pick one up or handle one, they are really, really nice. So anyway, there is that to end it up with this video, the Colt King Cobra. All right, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Please also consider subscribing to my channel so you know when I am posting these videos and I do post them every week. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.